Okay. So once again, welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, webinar. We are very pleased that uh, our, our speaker today is uh, Jean-Pierre Kalanian. He is joining us from Graz, Austria. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre. Uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, uh, we have met Jean-Pierre several years ago when he joined MCHEM, and actually he is, it's interesting because he gives us, he brings a completely different pers perspective, something we are, where it's not that common here, and we don't know many people doing what, what Jean-Pierre does, so it's a great pleasure to have him uh, here today. Uh, Jean-Pierre has a, a degree in international business, but more uh, more interestingly, he has a degree. Um, he also has a degree in psychology, and he's been working a lot, a lot of experience with kids, um, kids who have been in jails. So uh, different studying, different behaviors, studying groups, studying groups dynamics. So uh, he brings a, a little bit different perspective into into all of this. And of course, he can um, he can help uh, teams that they, they face different issues. So uh, if you would like to reach out to him afterwards, we can give you, I guess, the contact info, Jean-Pierre, that will be okay. So sure, sure. yes, uh, we are we are in great hands. Uh, if you uh, please turn the chat on, I will be monitoring the chat. And then if you have any questions, uh, write it in the chat. So not to interrupt, uh, maybe Jean Pierre, I will I will uh, manage the chat. And then as said, when Jean Pierre invites you to answer something or to answer uh, to give your opinion, please feel free either to write it down or to turn the mic on, whichever whichever is more convenient for you. So uh, I think Jean Pierre, I'm going to stop stop sharing my screen. Sure, sure. And let you share your screen. You should be able to share it now. And I will also switch my camera and mic. Do you see my screen? Is that? Can you see my screen? Not yet. Yeah. That's strange. Why not? I could go to share. That's strange. At the top, at the top uh, um, right corner, you see the red button saying leave, and then next to it, there should be a little square with an arrow. Yeah, it, and it says share, and I yes. did hit that button. And then it will ask you, what do you want to share? Is it your screen or? It's not asking me anything at the moment. Ah, we need permission to share your screen. OK, security and privacy settings. Should I just dismiss that or? I, I guess give it a try. Most private. Okay, this is not nothing's happening, correct from your side? No, we don't see it, yes. You do I, see I, it or you do not? We don't see it. If we don't have any other way, I have your presentation. I can share it if if this is not working. Yeah, it doesn't for some reason. Uh either when I hit Security and privacy settings, it does nothing. And if I hit dismiss, it just goes away completely. So I think, yeah, unless I'm missing something here, but nothing seems to be going. Okay, I will then. Hey, yeah, why don't you do that, please? I'm yes, sorry. No, it's okay. I will share the presentation. Let me just share my screen just a second. Okay, do you see it now? Yep, I can see it. Okay. Then I think everybody else should see it. That should be the case. Just let me know when do you want me to switch slides? Yeah. Um, can you put it, is, is that as large as it goes or can it go to a full screen or is that, I mean, it's also okay. Anyway. I will start. Yes, there we go. That's great. So um, I, I usually like to start off with a little question. I, I do like interaction. Uh, I'm not the type to just speak and then have questions at the end. So of course, participation is free. It's not mandatory. 
it would be nice to see your face if you do want to speak. Uh, but at minimum, of course, we would need to hear your voice. Or as Yelena said, you can also write into a chat box or into her box. So here we have a, a chameleon. And the topic is changing to a uh, changing to adapt or adapt, adapting to change. And if you can click the next to the next uh, question that pump comes up, is the question is does a chameleon adapt to change or change to adapt? Now let me just clarify what this means. In the first case, what I mean by adapt to change is that something happens. Yeah, I mean a great example would be COVID. Yeah, no one knew it was coming. It just suddenly was here upon us. So then the question is, how do we adapt to a change that has all, so the change comes first and then there's a need to adapt. It's more of a reaction, or it could be even like a defensive position. In the case of the chameleon, a prey is coming by, that's the change in his environment or her environment, and then he or she needs to adapt by camouflaging. In the second option, changing to adapt is you are being proactive yeah you are anticipating something you don't know what's coming but you're anticipating it so if the chameleon is going to hunt it doesn't know what it's going to catch all it knows is that it needs to put itself in a good position camouflage well and hope that something flies by he could fail he could not have anything or maybe within a few minutes he's caught himself some dinner so this is where I like to make this comparison with people and organizations because there are some people who sit and wait for something to happen and then react. Or there are those people that say, you know, I want to try something out. Um, I think our business is going in this direction or I think the market is going in this direction. And I think we need to already make some changes and, and try it out. So this is more of a proactive and more going on the offensive. So the next question is to you guys, so I will already open this up, is if you want to go to the next slide, please, is pretty much how do you see your, you can introduce yourself maybe real quickly and say, do you see yourself as someone who more so waits for something to happen and then reacts? Or are you the one to initiate, try something out and see what comes? Or even if your company, because I know on the list, I saw that there are actually a couple people who are from the same company. So it would also be interesting to hear the perspectives from maybe two people who are present from the same company and how they, how they see it. But anyway, I'll open it up for a few minutes. You can either type or just turn on your mic if you want to comment something. It seems to me that somebody should start, so I'll do it. Uh, Dejan Kosti, Atlantic Group, uh, responsible for IT uh, infrastructure and operations for the entire group, group so altogether 12 countries in the region and Europe. Uh, this is short introduction. Uh, regarding, uh, let's see that I'm in driving seat for implementing the changes. I will really adopt uh, quite a bit uh, the answer that you will put on the table or on the slide. If anybody else is from the Atlantic Group, it will be nice to hear that the perception so which, of others are the same, uh, is so, the same. So just to clarify, and, and let me, before we go further, you know, sometimes you can't predict everything. You can't always be in this, you know, predicting, knowing what's coming up. There are these elements and we're seeing it more and more in the world. There, there is a lot of unpredictability as well, um, but I'll get to that more at the end of this conversation. So just to clarify, which one do you see yourself more as? You see yourself more as the, the one who adapts to change or so proactive or reactive, I guess is the question. Proactive, as proactive. I said, okay. in a driving, driving seat. In a driving seat, okay, that's what you meant. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Or the, is another person you said from the, the, the from the Atlantic Group? Is that correct? Yes, group, and yeah. someone else is on here from the Atlantic Group as well. There was some invitation, but I'm not quite sure that colleague is uh, okay. with us. Okay. Um, I know at, at Cargo Partner, there's a, where two people signed up, but it can be anybody. 
If not, I will go on. OK, so maybe I can comment on behalf of the MCHAM team. So it's six, seven of us in the office, so we all work quite closely. Sometimes we, of course, try to, to try to be proactive, but sometimes we need to be reactive. Like an example, we had the um, lunch with Minister Choric that was scheduled for Tuesday, and two days earlier we find out that he can't make it. He needs to go with the prime minister somewhere. So in the nature of our business is sometimes we need to react on certain things, but as much as we can, of course, we try to be proactive. But I don't think when talking about companies, I don't think that any company is either A or B. I think most of companies are, are, are like us. You try to predict some things, you try sometimes even to be the leader in your field, depending on what you do, but sometimes you cannot, you, as, as much as you plan, as much as you try to be ahead, sometimes you just need to react. Yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, there is no one. One is not better than the other. I would make the case, however, and I would like to, you know, I'm up for debate on this, but I think if you're in the second, if you're in the driver's seat or if, you, if you're comfortable in the driver's seat, which means if you're comfortable taking risks, taking chances, making changes, then when an emergency comes or when something unpredictable comes, because you already have this mindset, because you're already willing to, you know, clear off the table and put something else on it. When, when something like this happens, I think you're better prepared. Uh, you are just because you, you it's in your genetic code. It's in it's in your. Uh, it's in your culture, you know, it's a part of what your team does. So I think people or companies that just wait and sit and wait to see what happens. Um, I think sometimes their reaction time may be a little bit slower, whether it's an individual, whether it's a team uh, or a company, that's all. But yes, both situations happen. Um, and yeah, I just think sometimes we tend to have a tendency to be prone to one or the other. And I'm making the case of, and it's also maybe more of an American mentality where it's kind of like, go for it, try it, let's see, let's see how it works. Um, in Austria, we have this, what they, in German, it's called Schaumamal, you know, like Schauenwia. So like, let's have a look, let's see, let's wait and see what happens first. And then maybe we react. So that's all, that's, that's all I wanted to say with this. So next slide then, please. So I was heavily influenced by this book, and this is also a good recommendation. Uh, I know we're past summer, but it's now fall. It's, it's not a, a recent book, but it's a goodie. And it's about organizational change. And in a lot of my presentation, some of it will come from here as well, too. And so you can all read um, for anything to change. Someone has to start acting differently. And in this book, he talks about Chip Heath and, and Dan Heath. They talk about actually something that they didn't even come up with. The originator of this is from the happiness hypothesis from um, a professor from the University of Virginia, and he talks about the elephant, the rider, and the path, shaping the paths. And I'll talk a little bit about more when we get into the process and how this impacts change and uh, creating a change culture. So uh, pretty much the elephant symbolizes your emotions and the rider is more so your head, so your head and your heart. And so the question is, how do you get to influence someone's heart and head? Um, in order to bring them further with change. We can continue. Uh, yeah, that's at the end. Yeah, that's the next slide. Okay, so three surprises about, if you wanna leave it like this, I mean, if, if the people can see it, I can also see it fine. We can also keep it like this too. You don't have to go to full screen if it's okay for people, if it's easier for you also, Yelena. So three surprises about change. What looks like resistance is often a lack of clarity. And by this, you know, when change comes, a lot of times it's, you're just given the order, we need to do something differently, but you don't know why. And so this confuses the rider. And the picture that I have is kind of, you have the rider, and of course I took, you know, um, an elephant to represent the emotion, or it's actually, the book uses this um, symbolism as well. And 
for motivating the elephant, what looks like laziness is often exhaustion. So what that means is when you're asking your team or your people to, to do something differently, keep in mind that they already have X, Y, and Z on their plate. They already have things to do, things to get done, uh, deadlines, obligations, so on and so forth. So you need to try to, you need to get over this hurdle as well too, if you're, especially if you're asking them to do something new or different. So his answer to this too is also to shape the path. And we'll, again, in, this, in the slides coming, we'll see more of this. Uh, and what looks like a people problem is often a situation problem. So a lot of times when we see people resistant to doing something, we start blaming them. They're lazy. Uh, they're not a team player. Um, they don't believe in the company values or the company's mission. We should let them go. Um, but a lot of times it's not the person, but the situation. And again, I'll explain that a little bit later. So next slide, please. So we'll start with the rider. And you know, if you look at his face, does he look like someone who is easily convinced? And I'm sure you have these people in your organizations as well too. And it's fine, you know, we're all different. Uh, there are 8 billion people on this planet. And yeah, it's okay that someone needs to be convinced or be, needs to be given a good reason as to why they need to do something. So to can help direct the rider or convince the rider, ambiguity and uncertainty exhaust the rider. And when someone is exhausted mentally, and you can look at your own personal lives, you default to the familiar. You, you fall back into your old habits and routines. I mean, I'm guilty of it myself. So clarity not only encourages the individual or makes it more clear for the individual, but it can also help rally what, the, what he calls rallying the herd. So again, providing a clear direction. So where, where is it going? Where is this change going? Why is it going there? And when you are initiating change, it's always, and even, you know, parenting is kind of the same. I don't know if we have any parents um, sitting here today, but provide clear, simple, reasonable, and measurable guidelines to the critical moves. So this is the how. So keep it simple. Keep it clear, keep it reasonable, meaning reasonable for me, it means implementable. So don't ask a department or a group of people to do something that's going to be too exhaustive or unclear. And another thing to do is whenever you're initiating change, it's not like people or your team or your company hasn't made a shift before. So you can always fall back on a prior example and say, you know what? Three months ago, we had this come up. Two months ago, we had this. Just yesterday, we had this. And we were able to do this, this, and that. And this is what I call also in what uh, Dan Heath calls building upon small wins. Because sometimes we hear, here comes a new challenge, and right away we start thinking of the problems versus what he calls scaling the successes. And... What's also big with, ch with, with change and uh, directing the rider is identity. You know, tying it into corporate branding, tying it into your mission, tying it into your department's purpose. Uh, positive peer pressure, because as you know, once you have a couple people moving in a direction, it's much easier then for others to, to jump on board. Language. This means when you're starting a new project or going into a new area, um, is there new language? Use new language to identify it. And this also helps kind of elevate its importance. It makes it special and it makes it, it makes it kind of catchy, or as we say, it makes it a bit sexy. Could be. And what's also important is whenever there's change, you have the reformers and you have the critics. And the reformers are your people that are on board right away and gung-ho about what you're doing. They're the ones usually leading the charge. You also have your critics. And it's important not to just quell the critics. It's, it's important to give them space. It's important to have them air their concerns because it's, it's bad enough that you know, people are not agreeing or not wanting to change. 
it's worse when they start doing things to sabotage the change. So you'd rather have, in my opinion, an employee or a group of people do nothing than try to actually sabotage. Because nothing means, okay, they're there and they're not helping out, great. But if they're actually doing things to sabotage or work against it, that's even more work for the few that are doing it. So give them the space, find a way to include them, find a way to hear their, gr their grievances or their concerns, find a way to tr try to somehow get them to buy in, try to find common ground where they can say, okay, I understand you're not fully on board. I know you're good at this. Can you see a connection where your skills, your department can somehow help us out? Next slide, please. So, Again, a question back out to, to you all. Um, how do you influence? Because you know some of you or most of you, as I see, are either in a director position um, or some type of management position. So how have you, or can you give an example of how, by, how you've provided clear direction? Um, the, S, the CSRM stands for clear, um, reasonable, measurable and simple how have you built upon or can you give examples of where you've maybe built upon small successes to get people to to move forward and i have in parentheses here time spent so the question is how much time and this is just a reflective question for yourself you can maybe write it down on the side and, and think about it later how much time are you spent do you spend looking at problems and how much time do you spend building upon successes and small wins? Where is your focus? Is it the focus is what you've already accomplished and how you can transfer that? Or is it more so problem, problem focused? How have you used corporate identity? Uh, how have you used peer, positive peer pressure? Um, how have some of you dealt with the critics? and included them. So this, this question is, is quite open. This is all about directing the rider, trying to convince people at an intellectual, logical level um, that what you're doing is worthwhile. So I open it up again for anyone to, to answer, giving using personal example, or, you know, examples. Don't need to mention names. It can be you know, quite neutral. Anybody? I mean, I can just say the critics. Uh, the critics are the ones who I think can can cause a, a lot of problems. And for me, it's always important to to give them the this, this space to air it because a lot of times critics just want to be heard. So just letting them air out their concerns for five or 10 minutes is sometimes enough for them to get on board. Um, or maybe they're just looking for a way. It could also be, I, I, I see it as what we used to call in the business and the social work business, like a cry for help in a way. And it's usually just these people who maybe need a platform or just maybe need the airtime for a few minutes. And, and once they've gotten what it is off their chest, then, then it's over. Um, but the minute there, you keep on, you know, suppressing them, not giving them the space, saying how they're wrong, um, that just drives them to want to, in a way, act out more. So sometimes just simply giving them the space resolves the issue for them. Okay, next slide, unless someone else, and anyone at any time, you can also just jump in if you, if you have a question or a comment. So, um, yeah, all of this, I mean, I know the screen is, is, is all here. Uh, I had it in the presentation where one thing would come up at a time so you weren't just inundated with, with a lot of information and pictures. So the sitting elephant is motivating the elephant. And I think all of us have felt like this at some time. Actually, until I saw this picture, I never knew elephants could sit like that. There you go. So motivating the elephant. So just leave it here for now. Just so there, there are three things you can do to try to 
gets reach someone at an emotional level to why they should adopt to change. And one is finding the feeling. So a lot of us are rational, um, but we're not really in the end rational beings. We're quite emotional. So if you can strike an emotional chord in someone, you're a bet you have a better chance of, of connecting with them and reaching them. Shrinking the change means is making the task at hand smaller. And growing your people, it's about this, you know, branding, identity, the buy-in. Um, if there's an issue, they should, if there's an issue in your company, they should be able to say, my name is, and this is my role, and this is how I can, you know, help in this area. So it's this identity, it's training, um, it's culture. So the next one, please. So as I said, you know, normally we are an analyzed think change, but this is not as effective as see, feel change. Um, you know, so looking at this elephant, for example, that's seeing. And for me, it stirs up, you know, when I think about the times when I'm kind of lazy or not feeling like doing anything, you know, that strikes a chord. I mean, that brings out a strong feeling. Um, and I look at that and I'm like, you know, I don't want to be a large elephant sitting down and maybe then I'm getting up and I'm going for a walk or going for a run. Now, there are some people in the IT here, I see. And uh, an example in the book, which, which I think is great, is about programmer empathy. So there was a study where, you know, programmers, you know, created a program. It was sent out to the field and six out of say roughly six out of 10 of the users of this program had issues and difficulties. The feedback came back uh, to the programmers and they're like, yeah, these people are just stupid. They don't know what they're doing. You know, my work is great, um, whatever. You just need to train them more. So this is an analyze, think, change process. But what they did was, it was an experiment where they, bought, they brought these programmers they had the people using uh, the software in a room and they had a, a one-way mirror. And so the programmers could watch the people using the software. And they saw the struggles and they saw where, where the hiccups were. And right away, they started feeling empathy. It wasn't like these people don't know what they're doing and they're clueless. It's like, wow, I see this person struggling. You know, I see them getting frustrated. And it was a see, feel, change and one of the programmers said that you know once he was watching this immediately he had, he could he came up with like 20 different new changes he would he could make to make this more user friendly and i think that's just a great example and a lot of times people at the top don't see what's going at the bottom so they're staying in an analyzed think no change most of the time uh, this is why it's important for people at the top to also have you know, be every now and then on the floor, as I like to say, or on the ground, seeing what's going on. Next bullet, please. And likewise, it's um, identifying change with a feeling. Again, using visuals or tactile touching. And there's another example. Actually, I saw that actually Marilyn is not her name, and the name is Robin Waters. She called herself a, a clothes fashion snob, never thought she would work for a discounter company and ended up working for a company called Target, which I don't know if in Croatia this is a, a known company. It's quite large in the U.S. It's a retail, large retail. And she was new to the company and didn't want to be the you know in the defensive side. She wanted to be, as was said, in the driver's seat. She didn't want to just wait to see what the high fashion was and then create knockoffs, which is kind of what these companies do. She wanted to be more in the trend position, setting the trend, not following the trend. So they had their usual lineup of sweaters and you know, it's, it's like your normal blah, uninspiring colors. And she wanted to introduce into the line more vibrant colors. And she knew she'd have a hard time convincing people. So what she did was she went to the store. At the time, M&Ms had like these all colored 
M&M candies. She bought, I don't know how many packages of that. Uh, I think she had a connection at an Apple store. And at this time, Apple had come up with these, also these different colors, um, these pastel colors for the computers. And what she did was these laptops. And she brought these laptops in and she opened up these uh, bag of, of M&Ms and just kind of had them on the table. And so people's eyes were flooded with all of this vibrant color. And next to it, she kind of had some of the sweaters that in their lineup, which was, you know, the usual beige, gray, black, who knows what. And this visual created a feeling within, and she was able to sell her point, get people on board, and, and move forward with what she wanted to do. I think it's also a great example. Next bullet, please. So, uh, styles of management. You know, um, you have external motivators, which are, you know, threats, salary, benefits, deadlines. And then you also have the internal motivators, which is ownership, pride, optimism, loyalty. Yeah. And of course, we do sometimes need external motivators or sometimes external external motivators are there. However, the more you can build in internal motivators, which is why you're seeing, you know, branding and culture uh, becoming more, more prominent. And, and you're, it's interesting just to watch in, in HR how you're not really seeing the word HR anymore. And in fact, I just gave a talk recently and I said, really, it's a lot about belonging. And then sure enough, my wife says to me, she, we used to live in Massachusetts and she used to work for the Museum of Fine Arts and she said they just hired someone for the director of belonging and inclusion. And this is the title of this person's job, the director of belonging and inclusion. And you know with the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement going on in the U.S., this is now and it's a part of the H, it's part of HR. And it's again tapping into that basic need of, of belonging. And ownership, pride, and optimism, loyalty, that all comes with that. Now, the EPIC model, that's my little contribution. And this is, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more, but this is a development model that I saw occur naturally um, with young people that I worked with. And it stands for explore, play, inspire, and connect. And what I saw was when you had a safe space that people would, these young people would just naturally become curious they would start playing they would start trying things out they were suddenly inspired to change and they were making new connections and i'll explain that a little bit more later next point please so as i said one of the things you can also do is shrink the change and this is an experiment which is quite interesting. You know how you, when you go to coffee shops sometimes or in the or car or car wash shops, they give you these cards and every time you go, you um, you get something stamped and after 10, you get a free coffee or a free car wash. So the experiment was this. They, they gave people with a card that had eight stamps on it and they gave some people with a card with 10 stamps but when you got the card with 10 stamps, you were already given two. So on it, it was already punched out two. So in both cases, whichever card you got, you had to go and buy either eight coffees or have eight car washes. And interestingly enough, I have these percentages here. It says 34% to 19%. And what it is, is that those that actually who got the card and completed it and came back and had their free coffee, let's say, the ones who had the card with 10, with two stamp, 34% of them completed it in comparison to the 19% that were just given the eight. Now, this is what's called shortening the perceived distance because I have 10, but I already have two done. So you already feel excited. You're like, wow, I already have two. I just need eight more. And this is the, this is the psychology behind it. And it's quite interesting. So I guess the point here is, if you are introducing change, find a way to already sh show that change has already happened to shorten, to shrink the change. Or another way to do it is to, to divide it up into smaller components. So if you have this 
a bigger project, instead of saying we need to, you know, build a new house, you start, well, yes, we need to build a house, but first we're just going to start with the entryway. And then we're going to, you know, work on the bathroom. Or you can break it up so that people have different responsibilities in dealing with it. So somehow, if you can find a way to shorten the perceived distance to the goal. Next bullet. So um, small targets, small victories equal a chain reaction of small positive behaviors, and this influences hope. And kind of going back earlier to the critics, you know, you want to shape the identity and culture where people want to be considered change makers. You know, they want to feel that they are not being asked to make a change, yeah, from up on top, but that they, they themselves are the ones who bring about the change. And this is more motivating, you know, this is more sustainable. If you can already have that feeling, and sometimes, you know, some companies are even, you know, changing the names uh, of their of their their people instead of calling them employees, they may even call them change makers. You know, in in my line of work uh, in social work, we just didn't call them, you know, staff. We called them, you know, counselors um, or direct care staff. Somehow giving them a title and identity, we're already in that. They're, you know, feeling like they are part of the change. Next slide, please. So, and again, at the end, the elephant needs to feel that it can overcome it. So once again, um, any ways that either of you have had to motivate the stubborn elephant in your team? Um, have either of you ever used a C feel change approach or had to strike an emotional chord with people to get them to go other than fear, let's say? Internal motivators, have some of you, you know, used shrinking the change or looking at corporate identity as a way to bring about change or any combination? It's always good to hear stories. I hope this is all making sense. OK, fine. Maybe at the end we have a little discussion. Let's go on. OK, so all of you know, let's just keep it here for now, what this is. This is a map of Ikea. And this is really, for me, a good visual of what it means to shape the path. It's quite clear. It's simple. Yeah, it looks pretty reasonable. Um, and if in a way you wanted to track people's flow through this building, it's probably measurable as well, too. And it does the job. You know, you walk through, you get people seeing things, and then you bring them down to buy. And so, in a way, what looks like a people problem is often a situation problem. So if this was a company that was saying, geez, no one's buying anything, uh, this would be a great way to look at, well, how is our setup? What are we doing? We can't be blaming the customers. Clearly, they want to buy something. Clearly, they need furniture. Clearly, they came here to buy a chair or an oven or whatever. Why aren't they buying? So the problem isn't maybe not on their end, but it's, what are you doing at your end to get your employees to buy in, to get your clients to, to buy your, your product? So the next bullet. So again, describe a compelling destination to override the rider's desire to debate, because that's what riders do. It's in the head. And these are the people that constantly ask you questions and try to defeat the um, the intention with with logic and questions and saying, uh-huh, but, you know, uh, they want to get you into this jam. But if the destination is compelling enough, um, then it's an easier sell and you'll have less questions. Next one. So again, why is the journey worthwhile? This also then starts tapping into the elephant. Again, tying it into your purpose, tying it into your 
your mission statement, tying it into your values, um, you know, tying it into your, your, your customers, your clients. Any way where you can cry, try to create this emotional connection, a feeling. Next point. And then tweak the environment for success. And uh, just again, like this map from IKEA and how they have this plan, this is tweaking the environment. This is saying, what can we do to get people to walk through our building and see everything and not just come in, grab one item and head out? Another example they gave, um, which what looks like a people problem, hit the next bullet. I'm not sure if this is, it could be here coming. Okay, so one, one example is um, for tweaking the environment for success is that they had a woman who thought she was pretty good at giving feedback to her people and always had an open door policy. And, you know, she felt she was there for her people. I mean, when she had her, her review done, the review came back not so good, saying, you know, she's not really paying attention. I feel like she's not present when I'm talking. And this really shocked her. And what they found out was just by looking at the setup of her office, what it was is she had her chair, she had her desk, and then on the other side of the desk, she had her the chairs for people to sit. But in front of her was her monitor, was her screen. And so what she realized was that she was, when people were talking with her, she was always sometimes glancing at her mail, uh, you know, and an email notification comes up, she would, she would look at it or something with her phone. And this was distracting her. So what they did was, or what she did was, she put her desk so it's facing the wall and the chairs were on the other side. And so when someone came into the room, she had to swivel, she had to turn around. So there was nothing in front of her. And at the next review, interestingly enough, um, her, her review came back more positive. So again, what looks like a people problem is often a situation problem. So before we start blaming someone for not being able to do their job well because of their personality, whatever, look at the environment. How can you tweak the environment? How can you improve it to make them more successful? And sometimes it's as easy as moving a desk, especially if you're in a management position. Um, and this fundamental attribution era, uh, like I said, is an office setup. Or, you know, if you find that people are eating too much, you know, they've done studies where all you need to do is just give people a smaller plate. If people have a smaller plate, you will eat less. Or, you know, if, if one, one click purchasing, Amazon has pretty much nailed that down. And then in about two or three clicks, you go from seeing what you want to buy, reading about it, and then all of a sudden you're at the checkout and you hit purchase. And before you know it, you're getting an email saying, you know, your product has shipped. So this is, again, how can we simplify and tweak the process? Uh, another quick one is I have this as no talking under 10,000 feet, and that has to do with with airline pilots. And what they realized was most the most dangerous time in airplanes is below under 10,000 feet when you're either taking off or you're landing. And so it wasn't a people problem. It wasn't that, OK, these pilots don't know what they're doing. They just realized, well, maybe we need to tweak the environment. So what they did was they created uh, the airline industry. That's like there's like absolutely no talking allowed below in a below 10,000 feet, whether you're taking off or landing. And once again, um, the accident rate and rates of issues happening decreased. Just real quick, um, the Hayden Matrix. Um, this is talked about in the book. I'll just briefly go over it. But what it is is. You know, whenever you're initiating, whenever you have a process in place, prevention should also prevention should always be considered because an event can happen. You know, for example, the cancellation of, of an appointment or an order, or I don't know what, change a request in, 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 in what the customer wants. And then a post event, so maybe a review. And this would be done, I would say, for serious events and Again, I come from the human services background, and it was possible often to have a crisis situation where uh, a physical intervention had to be done, where the police had to be called, you name it. And so we train our people to deal with these potential crises or 
high risk events in every department, every company, every industry has their high risk event. So for example, like this, the air, for the airline industry, it says no talking under 10,000 feet. That's a preventative measure. But say something can happen, say that something does go wrong. Okay, then you have an event. And then afterwards, it's like, okay, what can we do to make sure it doesn't happen again, or if it does happen again, we are even more prepared or have more ways to to respond. Next bullet or page. So I talk about the EPIC model, and if you can just leave it here for now. This is about now creating a culture. And like I said, the EPIC model, this explore, play, inspire, and connect. This is what humans you know, we're talking about digitalization and, and we're talking about what can computers do and what can humans do. And uh, you hear big names in the, in the industry, um, influences, people saying, we need to let computers do what computers do best in technology and we need to have humans do what humans do best. So I believe that these human skills will become even more important in companies as the more digitalized and, and, and the more technology comes into the workplace. And the good news is we have these natural abilities within us, especially when it comes to change and adapting and growing and learning. And in this picture, you see this girl on the rocks, right? She, no one needs to really tell her too much. You may give her some tips, but for the most part, she will get up there, she will climb. She will explore, yeah? She was discovering something new. She's playing. So playing is actually doing things, experimentation. You can see her, you know, maybe her balance is a little off. Maybe she falls a couple times. That goes with it. She's being inspired. As she's climbing every rock, she's gaining in confidence. She's gaining in skill. And she's saying, well, what else can I tackle? And she's making connections. She's making connections with herself. She's making brain connections, uh, you know, the synapses of firing, brain development, mobility. She's maybe connecting with her mother or those that are watching. And she's also maybe in this case, and as I talk about later, connecting with nature. All she needs to know, all this girl needs to know is that mom is there, that there's someone who has my back if something happens. There's someone that, there who can pick me up if I fall. There's someone there who can give me guidance if I need it, but I can do it. I can do it myself. In workers, I mean, I'm not saying that you should consider your, your, your employees as children, but the role of a manager, the role of a leader is to create this safe, non-judgmental non space. And if you can create that, your people will naturally develop and, and they will naturally grow. You almost just, it's like just kind of adding a little, you know, like a plant. You just add a little sun, uh, a little water, and the plant knows what it needs to do. Next point, please. So as I said, exploring is about learning, it's about discovery, it's exchanges between people, it's maybe it's that you know training would be involved in here. Um, just being curious, you know, going from this comfort zone to what I call the learning zone. Next bullet. So play is learning by doing. And again, it's experimentation. Uh, and a big one, I know, uh, we, maybe we can talk about this, how it is in Croatia. I know in Austria, for example, like the worst thing you can do is fail. Um, in the US, there are now companies when you apply and if you're in an interview and you cannot give one time in your life where you failed and what you've learned from it, you will not be hired from the company. Imagine that, like that's actually a requirement when you go into interviews now in some companies in the US is that you have to actually give and exp a, uh, explain a time where you actually had failed at something and what you got from it. Because every time this girl falls on her knees and scrapes herself up, she learns something. And the same is with your, with your people. Conflict resolution. Um, companies sometimes need more than just their mission in order for people to resolve conflict. Usually we, re we resolve conflict because we like the person or because we're having fun. So if there is no element of enjoyment, pleasure, if there is no element of camaraderie, of cohesion on your team, 
there is not much reason why I should resolve a conflict. In fact, you can almost see the opposite happen. I maybe get more if I create conflict, if I create tension. I get then kind of like a child acting out. I get the attention and no one else does. So play is really important because you acquire these people skills and you also, of course, improve your soft skills and communication skills. Next one. And this is also important, what you're seeing, especially with younger generations. Um, of course, as leaders and managers, you, part of your role is to inspire others, inspire those you know, below you on the org chart. However, what's becoming more prominent is that young people and people below you on the org chart um, want to inspire you as well, you know? And this is just natural. It goes, the inspiration goes both ways. And I think it's great when, you know, your team, your people can find ways to inspire you as well. Uh, it's just kind of like, it's a, it's a, you know, it just goes back, the energy goes back and forth. And in the end, it raises the entire level of, of the team or the department. And what's great is like inspiration has no precursor, you know, inspiration comes from anywhere. Uh, it can come from play. Okay, I learned something while wow, I'm inspired or it's because maybe if you go to explore, maybe you took a class and you learned something. And then connect is the last one, which is wanting to um, con make connections with yourself, learning new things. Of course, making connections with others is huge. And I think what you're seeing a lot in companies is this whole sustainability piece. This, this tying into nature, um, younger generations are seeing what's going on with the planet. They want to contribute, they want to respond, and they want to do something. So connection is really important. And then the last question um, to wrap it up, or we can just go right to the right to questions themselves, is how have you shaped the path? Um, can you create, as, as a leader, as a manager, do you create a compelling destination? How have you? How are you tweaking the environment to create success, to motivate people to change, and how safe is your workspace? And I'm, I'm, I'm not just talking about physical safety, uh, but I'm talking about emotional and psychological safety. Where if someone does something wrong, what's the response? If someone tries something out and it doesn't work out, what's the response? And how open is your culture? to um, the epic model because it, it's there and it will happen naturally. That's the last question from my part and just one final statement is the last slide is for me, as I said at the beginning, an organization that can has a change to adapt mentality is better able to adapt to change when it comes because it's you're already it's already in your gene, in your genetic makeup. It's already in your culture. It's already a part of your people and, and how they, yeah, and how they operate, how they respond, how they plan, how they execute. I think we're a little over time, but that's, that's the end of it. Thank you for me. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. So we have got just a few more minutes left. If anybody would like to comment something, add, ask, uh, please, now is the time. For those of you who joined a little bit uh, later, you can turn on the mic if you like to, to, uh, to ask something so you don't need to type. So please feel free to, to, to join uh, the conversation now. Well, I guess if we have uh, no more questions, then this would be it. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Uh, it was a it was a great presentation, and I'm sure quite helpful to understand different uh, you know points of view and how things don't necessarily are the way they seem uh, at the first glance. So this is always very important to remind ourselves. So thank you very much once again. Do Thank you, you have any final thoughts? Well, yes. I mean, I know there is a lot of little bits and pieces in here. Um, like I said, I would strongly recommend the book, um, but even if you can do any one, any one of these things or a combination of them, whether you're trying to influence the rider or the elephant, or if you're trying to shape the path or a combination of them, it will increase your 
chances of bringing about change or initiating change or getting people to buy into what it is that you're doing. So you don't have to hit them all. Um, if you know, and maybe you're already thinking, yes, I've done that. It could be also like just a, uh, uh, what's the word in English now? Sometimes, you know, working in German and going back to English, I even start losing my English, but it's just a reminder that, yeah, I am doing some of these things. Um, or maybe I could work on this in addition to what I am already doing. So just realize that we are emotional, a lot of times irrational animals and uh, human, you know, human animals. So we have to operate sometimes with people at an emotional feeling level and not just at the head level, especially in branches like IT or in technology um, or in industries where it's very mental. And I think that's where I see the biggest struggle sometimes coming into those companies because they're not so much a heart, gut, feeling type thing. They're more so problem solving. We stay in the head. But staying in the head alone may get your project done, may get your task done. But staying in the head alone will bring about difficulties with organizational issues. So you need to tap into both. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. I just want to say if, if anyone has any questions as well, I mean, uh, you can write to me, call me. I mean, I have a website as well, too. You can have a look there. Maybe something comes up later. Please feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. And yes, if they can find any information, they can reach you. They can contact us and we will provide them with your email. So it's not a problem. Fine. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Hope to see you soon at some uh, some of the other webinars that we're organizing. Once again, Jean Pierre, thank you very much for your time. And You're effort. welcome. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.